Okay. So yeah, so they are responsible for dictating every year in the month of February what the theme is going to be. Um, and so just to clear some things up real quick for those, because this is going to be, we're learning tonight, right? We're going to have a conversation. We're going to learn. Black History Month was chosen in February by us, um, by Honorable Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who was the father of Black history. Um, he chose that at first it was a week and it was supposed to coincide during the week of February 12th and February 14th. The reason he chose that week was because that was respectively Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass's birthday. So the great emancipator and the great liberator. And that's why he chose February. It wasn't because somebody else gave it to us and they wanted to give us the shortest month of the year or any nonsense like that. Um, so for me, Black history is important because it improves the social and psychological legacy for the individuals that have the ability to learn, remember, and articulate the tribulations and triumphs of ancestors in relevant situations. When you know your history, it stimulates internal pride, self-determination, and self-esteem built on substance that is able to withstand the various obstacles and adversities we each encounter in life. Once we learn history, it is our responsibility to apply the best of what our ancestors provided and build upon those structures to make our communities better, stronger, and unified. We can become twice that man or woman with this information because we are the receivers, philosophers, archeologists, anthropologists of previous findings, enabling us to recreate, implement, and refurbish the greatest minds of our humanity. I am going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, so today's topic is going to be Black resistance movements and a path to creating economic, political, and social power in our community. Setting the stage, I kind of already talked about what Black history was about, but before we go into this conversation, I'm going to go ahead and go flat out right now and let you know the truth will set you free, but first, it's going to piss you off. So some of the things we're going to talk about tonight, this may be the first time that you're hearing this, and but we, we can't keep running from the truth. We can't keep running from our past. In the words of Jay-Z, as he said, you can't run from the past, so go towards it. And there are some things that we have to expose ourselves to, ourselves through so that we can figure out how to get over this. Um, and so real quick, as I said, talking about Black resistance, I'll put these two books here because what's important for us to understand is that our history did not start with slavery. Um, we have been here for thousands of years before we came in 1526, if you wanna talk about the first time the 20 uh, African enslaved people came with the Spaniards, or if you wanna start it at 1619, um, which is when the uh, people came from Angola on the shores of Jamestown, Virginia. Um, but we were here thousands of years before either one of those dates. And so these are two great references for if you want to know our story before, um, before we were in captured and placed into slavery. Um, one thing I think that is very important for us to understand with the thousands of years of history that we have in this country, um, with the thousand years of history that we have, we put a lot of emphasis on the 400 years and because that was a very traumatic time, but we also, if we're gonna allow 400 years of that story to have the impact that it does on us, then I, I challenge you to say, what does 10,000 years of freedom, what does that story do to empower you? Because the story of slavery right now seems to disempower us, um, but we're gonna tell that true story tonight too, so that we can be empowered. But what would those 10,000 years do to empower you? Secondly, real quick, remember right now, we're just setting the stage. Um, I have seen people wear shirts with this um, quote on it, and I have also heard people say this, which is warning. I am not my ancestors sincerely these hands. Uh, I just believe if you are quoting that and if that's what you believe about the people that came before you, then you're definitely colonized. And the people who wanted to erase and brainwash you have succeeded at that. Um, tonight, we're going to find out just how much our ancestors were actually more courageous than we are today. And um, the approaches that they took 
to ensure or to fight for their liberties and to fight for the freedoms in which we have right now. So since the beginning of our civilization, we were living over in Africa, Asia, and Europe and the Americas voluntarily. Uh, after migrating out Africa and before the ravages of colonization, racism, and imperialism, the peoples of the African diaspora have always had to constantly fight off the attempts of threats against climate change, invasions, and disease. Resiliency has been embedded deep in our veins and the depths of our DNA. There exist strands with traces of tenacity, resoluteness, and resilience against some forms of struggle. And far longer than any than other civilizations, we were superior with favorable outcomes. So what we're gonna do is we're about to walk through the past to re-examine and redefine our present condition for a prosperous future. African-Americans, unfortunately, have been depicted in this country through cinema, cinematography. Uh, hold on, somebody's in the waiting room. All right, cinematography, anthropology, science, and media as lazy, apathetic, unintelligent, shiftless, violent, hypersexualized, a minority group of people that need measures in place to control their behavior and to oversee their bestial, primitive nature. So we, we really have to think about this, um, where the stereotypes and what they were trying to pass off falsely was that we were the characteristics that I mentioned. And as we see the rise in violence that's occurring in our community today, the uh, overemphasis on hypersexualization these were words that they placed on us when it wasn't true in order for the rest of society to be complicit in our subjugation and, in, and oppression, where they, they stated that we need somebody to be in control of us so that we don't exhibit these characteristics, which we see uh, permeating throughout our community nowadays and through our society nowadays and glorify whether it's really happening or not, we know that our media is trying to glorify and paint our community as engaging in these um, activities. And so that was part of what they used to coerce other people to allow them to be overseers of this, which then contributed to mass incarceration, uh, which then it contributed to redlining, putting us in certain communities, projects, and things like that. So we're gonna see how history, but also how verbiage was used as propaganda to subjugate us. And the reason why this is important, mind you, we're talking about history, but that is starting to occur again. And we're seeing that just here in the state of Florida with our very own government. So there's nothing new under the sun, but the problem is that when you don't study history and we, you, don't rec you don't know history, then you don't see what's occurring. And then you might be, when you try to combat it, you might use approaches that have already failed. But the gift is that people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Huey Newton, all those figures, they rolled down everything that they went through. So they're giving you the gift to tell you, hey, when you see this, do this. But the problem is we won't pick up our books and read them. Um, so then we don't even recognize how they're peeling back all of the progress that we made so far. Resistance through education. So again, we talked about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and of course, I can't do a presentation without at least invoking some of his thought process in this. Um, and so on this slide, we kind of talk about the impetus for Negro History Week. But something that we need to recognize is this. Black History Month was not for us to then begin doing what we're doing tonight, right? What Black History Month was supposed to be the celebration of what you did all year. And then it was supposed to, when you came to Black History Month, so for all of the things that you learned throughout the year, all of the events that you went to, or all of the um, conversations that you had, the plan that you had to improve our community, in the month of February, it was supposed to be presented. So that month, it, it again, it, it wasn't that, this was the only month where we we're supposed to recognize black history. This was supposed to be the month where after everything you did all year, you had your show improve. And so that's what the point of, of black history week, which then came black history month was for. And so we're also supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be in the school systems, teaching this information, right? To the kids, um, as well as at our community centers, our community centers are, are, are dormant right now. If you go around, 
and look for where is the Black history event at our community center where we're teaching what we're supposed to be teaching. So the Grasswork Network of Black Teachers used this week not only to lionize individuals and narratives, but also to teach students about racial progress and as well as shared and collective responsibility. All right, so let's jump into it, slavery. What I'm going to talk about is I'm not going to talk about the conditions of Black people enslaved. We get enough of that part of it. What I'm going to focus on is the, the rebelling that happened during slavery. So does anybody have any idea, because I want to make this as interactive as possible too, does anybody have any idea how many Black people or Africans, we're gonna use Africans, how many Africans came directly from the shores of Africa to America, to the United States? So you can put it in the chat if you want to, or you can um, just answer, uh, raise your hand and just answer on the um, on a call. How many Africans came directly from Africa to the United States of America? Uh, whoever is running the Zoom, if you want to, you can like jump in and acknowledge. I was going to tell you, I was going to ask you, AK, if you can make me a co-host, I can um, be uh, able to mute and do the thing. All right. Uh, all right. I got you. Thank you. Uh, Tyler Spam? I want to say upwards of like 11 million. Okay. okay. Anybody else? I see. I see a twelve million in the chat, and then we'll take another one. Uh, Pernell agree? No, I was gonna agree with twelve million. I heard about twelve million, but only like ten million survived. Twelve million, but ten million survived. All right. So the good thing about me being here uh, versus doing this in person, as as y'all can see, I got all my books. Um, I got all my books back here, so. I got me a book right here, um, um, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro. According to the database between 1525 and 1866, listen carefully, 12.5 million Africans were shipped to the new world. Some 10.7 million, to your point per note, your, some 10.7 million survived the dreaded Middle Passage disembarking in North America the Caribbean and South America. And how many of these 10.7 million Africans were shipped directly to North America, which was my question? Only 388,000. So out of 12.5 million and the 10 million that survived, only 388,000 African people um, were shipped directly to this country. So what does that mean? So that means that most of us went to the Caribbean first. We went to South America, the Caribbean, Brazil, Mexico. That's where we were at first. Afterwards, we got brought to America. So everybody, most of the people on this call probably have some type of Caribbean origins within their, within their uh, DNA somewhere down the line. I found out that mine was Haitian. I'm related to the founder of Chicago, John Baptiste Point de Sable. Found that out when I went to a family reunion, but that's so far back that I don't claim Haitian, you know, descent or whatever, but the, a Haitian is the patriarch of my family. Um, and they went there because they took them through a process called seasoning. The white men that were enslaving people here did not want Africans that came directly from the coast because they were too rebellious. So what you see over here, these rebellions, these were from rebellious Africans and some really originating from Haiti and Haiti's revolution had a lot to do with all of, with a lot to do with um, some of these, of course, except for 1675, Nathaniel Bacon, because that was beforehand. And so, um, so that's important, I think, for us to know and understand that only 388,000 of us came straight to America. But while we were here, it's not be because uh, Kanye West said slavery was a choice. It's not that we just sat here and just allowed ourselves to just be enslaved. There were many methods that were used to prevent um, white slave masters, slave owners from getting what they wanted. We faked illnesses. We would break machinery. We would work slow on purpose. 
And then also we was going straight at it with, with them. They were fighting them. They were, of course, running away. And so all of these are different rebellions. And I know pretty much the only one that we probably really ever hear of out of this group is Nat Turner's Rebellion. And remember, there was a movie that was just made called um, the movie that was Birth of a Nation, where they talked about that. And so we're going to explore some of these um, these different rebellions. But first, of course, we're going to have to start with the Haitian Revolution. So the Haitian Revolution, what's important about this is this is the first, just think about this. This is the first and only successful slave rebellion to occur in the Western Hemisphere and became the only post-colonial Black-led nation in the world. Since 1804, there has not been a um, Black nation ran and owned in, in this part of the world. Haiti was it. So these men and women overthrew their oppressor from three, they beat up on three European countries. They beat up on France, Britain, and Spain. These were what America is today when it comes to war, France, Britain, and Spain was that. And it was three of them. Today, United States holds that, holds that reign supreme power. But back then it was three countries that held the same place as the United States does today. And so one of the most prominent generals, we all hear about Napoleon Bonaparte. He was defeated by the Haitians, but you never hear about Napoleon Bonaparte being defeated by the Haitians. We learn that in history, but never hear that it was some black Africans that whooped up on Napoleon Bonaparte. And it's led to the Louisiana Purchase on April 11th, 1803, helping the United States to expand territory under its control. We beat up on Napoleon Bonaparte so bad that he had to give up the land that he had in the United States and sell that, I think he had to sell that to Thomas Jefferson. That's how the United States expanded. They didn't have that land. So they ended up uh, creating a deficit of uh, like $15 million or something like that on Napoleon Bonaparte. So the majority of those people enslaved were Yoruba from what is now modern day Nigeria, Fawn from what is now Benin and Congo from the Kingdom of Congo in what is now modern Northern Angola in Western Congo. The Congolese at 40% were the largest of the ethnic groups represented amongst the, those enslaved. The enslaved developed their own religion, a syncretic mixture of Catholicism and West African religions known as voodoo, usually called, uh, or known as hoodoo, usually called voodoo in English, this belief system implicitly rejected the African status as slaves. And we hear so much bad stuff about voodoo. Uh, we never get the truth about it. We make fun of it. But for the only successful slave rebellion to occur in the Western Hemisphere that created a Black-led nation, it was voodoo that was used to defeat them. And now that country is overwhelmingly um, Christian and Catholics. And you see the condition that they're in today. Uh, there's a question by JB. How you doing? Um, so it's actually um, surprising because like, when you really hear voodoo, it kind of has a negative connotation. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's kind of eye-awakening and it really surprised me to think that that was a way of defense that was used. So. I really, um, you know what I'm saying, I appreciate you mentioning that and just bringing that to the light because I never thought about that. Anytime someone says voodoo, I'm thinking about, you know what I'm saying? It kind of yeah. sounds negative. Something you want to stay away from, something you're scared right. of, but it's the fact that like, we see it as negative now, but that's something that literally was like used to our benefit back then. So that's and so And so you see why they're telling you to stay away from it, right? Because it worked. They're like, <laughs> yeah, we ain't trying to lose that power no more. <laughs> the, the, oh, just think about this when you talk about and i appreciate your comments too just think about this when you talk about power the people who are benefiting from the power from that condition will never give you the tools to liberate you and for them to lose the power that they have do i need to repeat that again the people who are in positions of power will never provide you with the tools that you need to liberate yourself for them to then lose said power. So in St. Mm -hmm. Domingue uh, produced 60% of the world's coffee. So this is some of the things, this is the reason why Haiti was so important. They produced 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the sugar that was imported by France and Britain. 
The colony was not only the most profitable possession of the French colonial empire, but check this out. It was the wealthiest and most prosperous colony in the Caribbean. And when they say the Caribbean, it's also talking about the United States as well. Um, because remember, the United States was not what it is today. So Haiti was the wealthiest and most prosperous colony at one point in time, a black nation, an African nation in the Western world. David Walker's appeal. Arguably, David Walker was had one of the most radical of all anti-slavery documents that caused a great stir when it was published in 1829. Mind you, we're still talking about during times of slavery. This is before the Civil War. This is before Abraham Lincoln came around, the so-called great, great emancipator, the person who gave us our freedom. No, nah, we took that. David Walker was a free black originally from the South and he wrote, they want us for their slaves and think nothing of murdering us. Therefore, if there is an attempt made by us, kill or be killed and believe this, that it is no more harm for you to kill a man who is trying to kill you than it is for you to take a drink of water when thirsty. Even outspoken William Lloyd Garrison objected to Walker's approach in an editorial about the appeal. So he was the one, um, they, they, it's not Paul Revere, the one who says the British is coming, the British is coming. I forgot who it is, but there is another colonist and they say, who said, give me, give me liberty or give me death. He actually got that from a black enslaver who said that when he was trying to liberate himself from under the foot, under the boot, under the knee of white men enslaving black people. That's where give me liberty or give me death came from. Jamaica and the Maroon communities. So um, the Maroon communities are highly important uh, to liberation. Um, they, and specifically Queen Nanny is actually a woman uh, born in Ghana around 1686, the renowned leader of what was called the Windward Maroons and probably was a con and part of the West African Ashanti nation. Ashanti is not the name of a singer. Uh, she got that from the name of a West African nation. Queen Nanny, a woman, fought against the British forces and led other fellow Jamaicans at the height of the conflict in 1737. During an upheaval caused by the transition from Spanish to English rule in 1655, many of West African slaves formerly owned by the Spanish escaped into Jamaica's hilly interior and pioneered the resistance to slavery that would continue in Jamaica for most of the ensuing, ensuing 200 years. These escaped slaves developed their own separate culture based on their West African roots known as the Maroons. The British were never able to recapture or subdue them and they were granted political autonomy in 1739. These Jamaicans, this woman, these people down in the Caribbean, they were whooping and beating up on these white oppressors so bad that they ended up getting their liberty and their freedom in 1739, the Maroon community. Their descendants and culture still exist today in modern Jamaica, and it's a testament to their skill and tenacity. Usually when you run into Maroons, Maroons are known as living off the grid. Um, so if you ever go to Jamaica, you go up into the hills. Um, and the reason why this is important because up in the hills, that's where all of the, of course, the food and stuff is grown, but there's a coffee that is grown up there in Jamaica and it is called, it is a uh, Blue Mountain Coffee. Blue Mountain Coffee is actually some of the most important and most coveted coffee that is sold in the world. And it's right there in Jamaica and Hills. Um, and lastly, remember I said that the Windward Maroons were freed in 1739? Well, slavery ended up becoming abolished in Jamaica in 1807. Now, mind you, I told you this real quick. I see your uh, hand, Melvin, I'm about to get to you. Um, the majority of Africans came from the coast of Africa. 93% of them went down to the Caribbean. Then they went from the Caribbean to the Americas. Well, down in the Caribbean, those Africans had found ways to unite. And they said, to hell with this. We about to beat up on them. And we're just going, we're going to cause all types of chaos. I mean, they were setting fire on plantations, doing everything. If you notice, we didn't get free in America so-called free until 1865 and they really didn't get up off of us until 1965 but in jamaica and haiti you're looking at 1804 and 1807 respectively 
Uh, go ahead, Melvin. Uh, so my question was just on uh, Queen Nanny. I was just trying to figure out, uh, was she just like a special case or was it like, uh, was it common for a woman to be leading nations around that, well, leading that nation around that time? So, um, no, she, she, she was not necessarily a special case. Women were, uh, where's my book? We were, it was a, a couple of women that were actually leading revolts and wars. You had Queen Kadanke, uh, which is translated today as Queen Candace of Ethiopia. You had, uh, Queen Asintewa. You had Queen, um, Queen Hatshepsut. That's, that's a little bit far back. Um, Harriet Tubman. We all know about Harriet Tubman. So Harriet Tubman was from West Africa as well. She was from the Dahomey tribe. And if you know anything about the Dahomey tribe, y'all heard about Women King, right? Then in Black Panther, you heard about the Dora Milaje, right? The Dora Milaje, the Dahomey, what the Dora Milaje in Black Panther was the Dahomey tribe, which was a tribe full of warrior women that had about 6,000 warriors in it. That's just the part that they don't tell you about as far as women warriors and women that contribute. Remember Harriet Tubman, and I got a slide on her coming up, but Harriet Tubman did 13 trips, freeing over 70, uh, 70 people that was enslaved, but contributing to the uh, freedom of about 300 people because she had a leadership post in the Civil War. She had a troop that she led in the Civil War. She was a spy. So um, Queen Nanny is not a, um, she's, she's not a unique case. Of course, there are more men than women, but we don't hear enough about what the women were doing. And same thing with the Haitian Revolution. There was a woman who was at the leadership of that as well. Did I, uh, did I answer your question? Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yes, yeah, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, a book I would recommend is this book right here called The Destruction of, of uh, Black Civilization. And it'll tell you about the women fighters um, as well and how we went from being, because everybody asked the question, well, how do we go from kings and queens to being in the condition that we're in right there? That book goes through the whole entire research. All right, so my next slide. My president was Black long before Barack Obama. How come we didn't hear about the Black president that existed back in September of 1829 named Vincent Guerrero? Always keep in mind, that black people did not come straight to America. We went, or Africans did not come straight to America. We went to the Caribbean, we went to Brazil, we went to Mexico first. The United States was not the United States. It was only 13 colonies. So what is called Mexico, which is why I put this map down here, you will see that California, Mexico, and Texas, what we know of today was classified as the United States. So it's a little play on words, but he was actually the first black president in North America. Why we don't learn about him, I have no idea. All right, next, um, the Underground Railroad. So remember I said we was gonna talk about some things that you may have heard of, but we gonna, we gonna go at this with a different approach. Where did people first run to on the Underground Railroad? Can anybody answer that before we put it in the chat or anything? Go ahead, uh, Dennis. Oh, wasn't it uh, Kendra? That was running up to Kendra. All right. That's All right, cool. Can I get another answer? Dang, Chris Keefe, you don't know? Well, I ain't gonna start calling people out. <laughs> Weren't they, um, they would escape to the north until laws were created uh, to give plantation owners uh, resources and ability to hunt uh, nationwide, so they had to run to Canada from that point on. Okay, all right, cool. So that is the story that we are told. That is what that is how we know it because we have we have people teaching us history who do not study history. The very first people enslaved in this country did not go north. First, they went south, and they ran into the lands of Texas, Mexico, and right here where we are, Florida. Late 1600s and early 1700s, there was drama unfolding between Spain and England, which spurred differences involving Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, and St. Augustine, Florida. In 1738, the governor of Spanish Florida, Manuel de Montiano, had the fort established as a free Black settlement 
the first to be legally sanctioned in what would become the territory of the United States. That fort exists over by St. Augustine and it's called Fort Mose. Here it is right here. So you see this map, brought a map out here. See Georgia and Savannah, they was going this way. If you look over here by, uh, you can, well, Louisiana and Texas, you can see those arrows going, going south. Um, and the reason why they went south first is because people didn't really know the northern routes like that. The ones who were able to go north were typically those that was enslaved up in like Maryland and Virginia. But the biggest, remember, the biggest amount of slavery that occurred was down in what they call the Deep South, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, Louisiana, like New Orleans. So they wouldn't be able to make that trek, even though they eventually did. But we said, where did people go first? And first they went down into the South and they exploited the war that was going on between Spain and, um, and Britain and England. They exploited that war. So the Spanish said, here was the condition though. The Spaniards said, y'all can come South. We'll protect y'all. We'll free y'all. Y'all can do whatever y'all want. But here's one thing, here's the catch. You have to fight in the war for us. Cause mind you at this time, the um, England and Britain didn't want to enslave black people cause they were scared. They didn't want to get black people guns and weapons cause they like, do you see what we're doing to them? If we give them weapons, they gonna just, they gonna kill us. They gonna slaughter us. So we ain't giving them nothing. The Spanish was like, yeah, we'll give you weapons. We'll give you whatever you need. So they came south, but they also had to then change their religion and they had to become Catholics. So that was the other condition. So that's how you get African um, Africans starting to become Catholics is because they wanted their freedom. So they was willing to convert. And then just the other pages, just so you can kind of see how intricate uh, the Underground Railroad was, that they was using code languages, then they already had positions and certain words that they were saying. So it was a very intricate situation, all right? So now we're moving up out of slavery and we're going into Reconstruction. So Reconstruction uh, had about 2,000 Black Americans that had achieved some kind of public office. Nationwide, there are only about 600 people, Black people that are in office. So we went from 2,000 after slavery, 1865 to, to 1877. And then now we a hundred and what, how many years, 150 years or something like that after slavery. And we got less people in office representing us now than we did with some black people who had just fresh out of slavery. What's going on? So the Freeman Bureau funded by the government and supported by black churches and philanthropists provided food, clothes, medical aid, and transportation vouchers to enable people to reunite with family and find work. Thousands of black and white Northerners traveled to the South to set up schools and teach. Frequently, they were attacked by hostile Southerners opposed to the betterment of formerly enslaved peoples. Teachers often had to be protected by US soldiers. Teachers who were coming down to the South from the North who were trying to teach black people, um, you know, just rudiment rudimentary um, lessons had to be protected by US soldiers because there were white, white people at the time, they were trying to um, stop us from just learning how to read, learning how to do math. They understood that a person who is educated cannot serve as a slave. It is only the ignorant who can be enslaved. And you notice that, I don't know if you all ever seen the videos, but people who know their rights, people who know the law, they typically can't be um, done dirty by cops on the streets or they can't be done dirty in a courtroom. You don't have to be a lawyer to know the law. You just, if you want to protect yourself, it's best to educate yourself. When state aid was absent, this is important. When state, state aid was absent, black communities helped themselves by pooling their meager funds to hire a teacher and find an empty building. This is how your HBCUs were created. One of the most successful initiatives of the reconstruction era was the education program that created more than a thousand schools in the south those students went on to attend what we know now as hbcus but what's also important to hear is public education public education which means those schools that's in the neighborhoods all around the country those schools that you go to based off where you live at where you don't have to pay to go to that school where you get an education that was started by black people 
Black people from out of slavery understood the importance of education, that they set up a whole public education system. That's how we got public education. That wasn't a thing that government was doing. They didn't find that important. Black people started that. But we're not told that the education system that we find today, the fact that you're able to go to school in the neighborhoods where you go, even though those schools are underserved and they're underfunded, that's because the government didn't start that program and they didn't want to do that. So the only way those schools improve in your community is if we improve them because we were the ones that created a thing called public education. So how many people know about 40 acres and a mule, right? We heard, we heard of 40 acres and a mule. What was that? Anybody tell me what that was? Uh, wasn't it like our reparations for slavery? So what that mean? Who's where, where do we get that? How do we get it? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how we get it, but it was supposed to be for everything that we were put through. We we're given 40 acres of the mule. Okay, let me ask you this real quick, and it's cool if y'all know the answer. We just remember we just having a conversation. This ain't I'm not I'm not asking these questions. Like this is a learning experience right now for us, so that we can understand history. Who mm -hmm. dictated? Where did the 40 acres and the mule come from? Who dictated that? That's what we gonna get. I'm not sure. Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess at that? Who dictated? Where the 40 acres and the mule come from? Um, I believe, wasn't it uh, a president after um, the Civil War had ended? I, I forget who, which president it was. Okay, I appreciate that answer. So again, how, okay, how did we get Black History Month? Who gave us Black History Month? Carter G. Wilson. Right, well, a Black person, us. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. We dictated 40 acres and a mule. Nobody gave us that. Nobody said, hey, all right, this is, um, since y'all free, all right, this is what we're going to give y'all as far as reparations. We're going to give y'all 40 acres and a mule. No. I mean, you, can, you can actually look at, I'm looking up here in my book. Where is that at? Um, but anyways, they went around and they asked these pastors, uh, and these people who were represented at the church, what do Black people want? They didn't, because remember, white, they didn't know how they can make things right. They just, these are, we talking about the abolitionists now, the people who were trying to come in and do the right thing. It was like, we don't know how we can make this right. Like, what is it that we can even do to, I don't know, begin to start to right the wrongs of what you all experienced? So the Black pastors had went back and they went um, and talked to some people and they had a discussion about that. And then they came back and said that, here it is, page 37, 39. They said that what we want is land. And I'm going to give you the exact name of the person so that you can go up and look it up if you want. All right, here we go. Garrison Frazier, Terrell Sherman. So the reason why I got William T. Sherman, because that's who they were talking to at the time. Um, the Negro wanted land. The way we can best take care of ourselves, Reverend Frazier began, is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. And we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We want to be placed on land until we're able to buy it and make it our own. And when asked where the free slaves would rather live, when scattered among the white, whether scattered among the whites or in colonies by yourselves, Brother Frazier replied, without a missing, without missing a beat, I would prefer to live by ourselves, for there is prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. And that's how special field order number 15 was given after President Lincoln approved it. Now, where was that land at? That land was supposed to be down in Georgia, uh, South Carolina, and Florida. This was supposed to be black, black land that was given. The, we're, we're right now, we exist on land that was supposed to be given to us. Well, and they, was, they were giving us 400,000 acres between South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So what the hell happened? Why did we get our 40 acres in a mule? Because Lincoln was assassinated. President Andrew Johnson came in and said, hell no, we're not giving y'all nothing. Took that back. And they actually gave the reparations to white uh, slave owners. And they gave them that land back and uh, paid them for every slave that they lost. They gave them a dollar, gave them a dollar, a dollar figure. So that's how we lost our 40 acres and a mule. The White House, uh, Tom said, okay. 
start getting moving a little bit quicker. Um, it's just, as you can see, it's just so much. And, and there it matters as to the way that you look at our history. It matters how you see these things because one thing suggests empowerment and the other thing suggests begging, right? One thing suggests that I get what I need when other people tell me that I can have it or if I continue to beg for it. But then another way of history was like, well, damn, the only way we got what we wanted was when we put up resistance. When we unified though, and when we pulled our resources together, they are not afraid of you individually. They are afraid of your collective capacity. We have to remember that. As individuals, that's why the nation's motto is united we stand, divided we fall. And what do we do? We all could quote that and we find so many ways to divide ourselves every single day, whether it's you're from Broward or you're from Miami-Dade or you're from Tampa or you're from Duval or you're not from Florida, you're from Georgia. We find all these different ways. You're from the West side, you're from the North side every day to divide ourselves. And what happens? The people who have power maintain that power because guess what they do? They're collective. They're collective in their goal of oppressing and suppressing you. So in every, every, every example that I'm going to give you, you're going to see unity. And so we're going to jump forward a little bit. Jim Crow, you've heard about Jim Crow. Well, Jim Crow actually came from a person. Jim Crow was a name that somebody named Thomas D. Rice came up with, and he was wearing blackface. And this blackface character was named Jim Crow. And that and Jim Crow was supposed to be portrayed as, of course, a black, ignorant, and lazy person. And so that name has been used from 1838 all the way through the 1960s. The rebuttal to this mischaracterization, uh, we'll, we might get into that, but I might go ahead and skip over that um, as well. The rebuttal to it is, is just a lot of all of that you're seeing where we're talking about now when we start to go into the 60s and stuff like that. We'll go past the Civil War. It's just important, important facts about the Civil War is just know that 40,000 Black soldiers died and there was roughly 179,000 Black men who served as soldiers. The point of the Civil War, the Confederates were fighting for the protection to keep us enslaved and the Union was fighting for the liberation of us slightly, but the protection really of maintaining the union, maintaining a unified country, that's what they wanted. And so black people were so instrumental in that because at first they didn't wanna let us fight, but it wasn't until the union was losing that they said, damn, we better get them some guns and let them, let them come over here. We'll find a way to use them as, they'll be contraband. Cause remember the civil war didn't free us. It just, it made us contraband at the time. And so looking into the, looking more in depth into the Civil War will give us even more. But again, you see us doing what? We're fighting, we're trying to resist the conditions of which our people were in. Uh, the Fist Jubilee singers, they're important. Uh, that's where like your gospel music and stuff comes from. Um, what happened with them, why they're important is because they were formed in 1871 and they toured around the world, specifically in Europe. And it was arranged by a lady named Ella Shepard. But they did this to raise money. And at the same time, they countered to mischaracterization of African-Americans as being unintelligent. Because in order to compose music for, for white people, they would say the way that in order for you to compose music, you have to possess some form of intelligence. So the fact that they were able to come up with their own music, the notes and all of that, it debunked what people were saying about Black people at that time being less intelligent than white people. All right, so these are all of the different Black massacres that occurred in the United States, um, pretty much from the 1800s through the 1900s. And so you've heard about Tulsa. There were 300 people that died in Tulsa. Um, during Reconstruction, there's 2,000 racial terror lynchings that occurred of Black men, women, and children from 1865 to 1876. And then between 1877 and 1950, 4,400 lynchings took place. Uh, the central figure, as far as the lynchings go, was Ida B. Wells Barnett. Uh, she was instrumental of writing about that and bringing to America 
the torture and torment that occurred when it came to lynchings. Um, you'll see in 1919 Red Summer in the span of 10 months, more than 250 African-Americans were killed in at least 25 riots, uh, the US by white mobs that never faced punishment. And then between 1964 and 1972, there were 300 rebellions that occurred in cities across the nation. 60,000 people were arrested and billions of property damage and 250 people were killed. And that's just a couple of the massacres. As you can see, all of these had casualties of Black people who were dying at the hands of white mobs um, when all they were trying to do was liberate themselves and just wanted to experience freedom. Uh, John Tate, I see your hand. Yeah, I saw one said 2015, and I know I don't really be in the news too heavily, but... Oh, Charleston, Charleston. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. No, I, I don't remember That's, like a that bunch was, of black that was uh that. that was your boy who they took to go get the um go get the Burger King Dylan Roof. Okay, so where they killed where they killed nine people in the okay, church. Gotcha, yeah. yeah, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, protect the narrative of our story. Uh, so this was an individual. This is how now the narrative is starting to seep into the universities. And so now it's, we're, we're becoming a science. So now they're saying our unintelligence is becoming scientific and they're using this and they're starting, they're using this information to make other white people, just the everyday average white people even, mad, even matter. So you have people who are now authority figures on black intelligence. And so a good book to read for that is this one called Stamp by the Beginning, Stamp from the Beginning, um, by Ibram Kendi X, and then of course 1619 Project. And what's unique and special about these books is they are banned in the state of Florida. They are on the banned books list. So that's that's the type of government that you have because they don't want you to know the actual story. They have banned these books in the state of Florida. You can still find them though, but just know that they're on a banned list. Um, so correcting the history and passing the truth of the white South, this is what he said. He painted the story in saying that he's correcting the history and he's gonna pass the truth of the white South as being victimized by the corrupt and incompetent black politicians and the North was mistakenly forcing reconstruction before quickly correcting itself and leaving the, leaving the noble white South to its own wits. This man went on to write a series of novels and was responsible for training a generation of influential Southern historians who became department chairs and dominated the discipline of history for decades in the 20th century. So this was happening um, during Reconstruction, 1877. So you have to ask like, well, what, how is this stuff permeating down through the line and occurring through today? So they have figures who are renowned that were then articulating these points of don't trust black people because they are incompetent or because they will steal, they will lie, do deceit, and this, this, and that. So that caused a lot of rebellions. And that's where, again, you go back to the massacres it was information that spurred these revolts, but by white mobs. Um, you have the New Negro. So the New Negro, that was Black people, again, trying to change the way the world saw them. Um, so that's when they started to come up with, well, we're New Negroes. And that's what they were saying. Like, we don't just stand by and do anything. Mind you, they had a false notion of what was going on in slavery uh, as well. But I still understood that they were trying to subvert the people that were known as just the one they're gambling, they rob and steal, they're apathetic, they're, um, they choose unintelligence. So this is how you have the rise of the Harlem Renaissance. And I know the Harlem Renaissance is something else that we point out as well. But on this particular slide, he pointed out that the thinking new Blacks committed to combat stereotypes they were trying to awaken Black national consciousness and pride, as well as improve the social status of African-Americans. What I'll say quickly about this is that when you talk about the Harlem Renaissance or just the Renaissance period, that was not only in Harlem, it was actually around, it was in Detroit, it was in Washington, D.C., it was in Chicago, it was in a lot of places. It was just a, uh, 
a united front of radical and self-defending to pursue the right to political and social equality. But the problem is that the Harlem Renaissance was never supposed to end. That's the, that, this was in the 20s. The Renaissance is still supposed to be going on today. And unfortunately, when we talk about the Renaissance, we talk about it as something in the past. So we need to kind of keep that in mind um, as we continue forward and know that these same ideals, this is just a starting point. This is a foundation and we're supposed to continue to build from there. Marcus Garvey, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. So Marcus Garvey was dedicated to racial pride, economic self-sufficiency and the formation of an independent black nation in Africa. Um, he had an organization, UNI staff, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And their model was one God, one aim, one destiny. In Jamaica, you hear one love. Well, one love spurred out of the motto of the UNIA, where they keep on, you know, and then you also hear in the song, uh, the game has called One Blood. All of that is talking about the oneness that we're supposed to maintain. Um, Garvey knew African Americans would not take action if they didn't, did not change their perceptions of themselves. Garvey was the one who proclaimed Black is beautiful long before it became popular in the 60s. He wanted African Americans to see themselves as members of a mighty race. We must canonize our own saints, create our own martyrs, and elevate to positions of fame and honor Black men and women who have made their distinct contributions to our racial history. He encouraged parents to give their children dolls that look like them to play with and cuddle. And he did not want Black people thinking on themselves in a defeatist way. I am the equal, he said, I am the equal of any white man and I want you to feel the same way. So now you're starting to see these thinkings. This is uh, like the early 1920s, again, during the Harlem Renaissance. So you start to see this thinking change where you have empowerment and where intellect rules the day. Um, then you have art that comes in and you'll see that black artists, writers, photographers, and musicians participate in the black arts movement, the Harlem Renaissance, the Chicago black Renaissance, which were the soundtrack and visual representation of resistant movements. These individuals created art that supported the resistance movements, but also provided space for Black people to express love and joy. That was the point of art. The art that I don't even know today, I, I don't even think that we're approaching artistic representation from, these, from this lens. And so you use things like poetry, fiction, short stories, plays, films, and television to counter stereotypes, not to uphold and perpetuate the stereotypes. And then um, you use these th those methods and those approaches. Right now, these things are used against us to talk about the very things of which we don't want to represent ourselves, but because there is an agenda. Uh, you also remember I was telling you the Renaissance happened long outside of Harlem. It was also in Chicago. You move up to the 60s and then you have Black Power. And this is where Black Power starts to come in at. Hey, uh, Who's ever watching the time? How much, uh, how much time I got left? C-A-D-C, how much time I got left? All right, I'm gonna keep going until they cut me off. All you, right, you so Black, oh, okay, Black you Power. Good. Black Power was a call for Black people in this country to unite, to recognize their heritage, to build a sense of community, it was a call for Black people to begin to define their own goals, to lead their organizations, and to support those organizations. It's a call to reject the racist institutions and values of society. Black power, uh, well, let me go to the next one. The goal of Black self-determination and Black self-identity is full participation in the decision-making process affecting the lives of Black people. All right, so let me stop right there real quick. Black power was never meant to say, um, white people aren't important or a, a black supremacy is what we're trying to speak about here. You got to realize the mind frame and the mindset that they were coming from is that people were seeing themselves as lesser than. So they were trying to find a way to empower people to have them know and have them see themselves as I am just as important. I have made the same amount of contributions to being an American as anybody else has, if not more. Um, I am qualified. We took into our own hands 
the ability to build institutions that represented the best of what we had to give. Remember, as much as I don't like to talk about Martin Luther King, not because he wasn't important, just because I feel like we talk about him ad nauseum, Martin Luther King was the exemplar visual figure for morality and integrity. His whole movement was based off of morality. He had, it was nonviolent. He told, if they hit you, don't hit them back. We're gonna love them. We're gonna love them the way that they're not loving us. We're going to love them the way we want them to love us. Who does that? You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's what, what his movement was about. So it was never, it, it was never about violence and black power was never supposed to, it's supposed to jump over. It's just supposed to say, hey, I am proud of who I am. That's all that it meant. And so you will see, so we have to define this stuff because if we don't, other people are going to define these things for us and we're going to mischaracterize movements. And then we're not going to want to do what? We're not going to want to implement it in this day because we don't want to offend somebody. But us not offending somebody is assimilating and then allowing them to add the definitions onto our own movements for lack of us doing research and gathering our own understanding so that we can edify and explain to those people, here is the context of which they actually meant. But in order for you to be able to articulate that, you got to put your head in some books for a little bit, a little bit of time and gather some understanding. So Black Power was about a holistic struggle for human rights, not Black rights, human rights that seek universal justice through the lens of Black people's historic oppression and struggle for self-determination, culminating in a long overdue quest for Black power. This is important. After Malcolm X's assassination on February 21st, 1965, thousands of Black students, activists, ordinary citizens, draw to his cause, I'm setting the timer on myself so I don't go too long, um, citizens draw to his call for political self-determination. What did they do? Because we need solutions here. What do we need to do? They created study groups, Black student unions, independent political parties, that means outside of the Democratic Party, outside of the Republican Party, with the goal of achieving, of achieving citizenship through political power, racial solidarity, and cultural transformation. The reason why this is important is because it says who did it, thousands of who? Black students, activists, and ordinary citizens. When you look at the age of these people who are defining these movements, it is not 50-year-old men and women that are overwhelmingly leading this effort. Malcolm X was 27 years old when he came on the scene. When Martin Luther King did the March to Selma, that was the first thing that he did that really catapulted him on the scene. He was 25 years old. Angela Davis was 19. Huey P. Newton was 24. I, how many, I can name you countless figures, the sit-ins. The sit-ins that occurred at the lunch counters was done by students at NCAT, college students at NCAT. So the reason why I'm placing emphasis on this is that this generation this community, this society does not move forward unless you step up to the plate, start to learn and go out there and effect change. The change that occurred in this community was always led by young people. When Harriet Tubman was freeing slaves, she was 27. She was 20, no, no 30 year olds, no 40 year olds. They, that's not who saves our community. The people who created the fraternities, the sororities, the organizations that you all have on campus, the founders of those, they were 21. They were 20. It's grown men who are in these organizations who are 50 and 60 and love these organizations to the core, but they're loving something that came from the minds of youth. So that is, that's why we have to place emphasis on this. When you're looking at the civil rights struggle, you're looking at yourselves. So what, here's, how you, here's how you measure what you would have done back then. What are you doing now about the situations that we find ourselves in, which is I'm about to end on that. Whatever you're doing now is exactly what you would have done in the 60s. It's what you would have done in the 20s. It's what you would have done at any period in time. So if you're sitting on the sidelines now waiting for a savior, you would have been sitting on the sidelines back then. 
But the only person that's going to save us is you all. Wilhelmina Jakes, Carrie Patterson, the women who participated in the bus boycott, they were FAMU students. Any movement you want me to go to, they were students. So the question is, what are you all going to lead today? What are what are what is it that we have to resist today? I'm gonna go ahead and jump forward. Oh, let me say this is this is this right here is what Ron DeSantis is trying to take away from us. We heard about he's trying to take the AP African American history course away. What he already did was he he did the redistricting, so he's already limited how many black people can represent, um, can be represented today in the Congress, and he took away two African-American seats already. And so now he's moving into African-American history in a classroom. So now Ron DeSantis is essentially saying, I'm gonna call it a bluff. I look around, I don't see them really doing anything now. So I'm about to redo everything that their ancestors did because clearly they don't care. And I just got the power to do it because they're not gonna stop me. So now he's going, and he, these are the four things that he's focused on. In the AP course, they talk about the origins of the African diaspora. So that talks about, remember, this says African empires and kingdoms before and during the transatlantic slave trade. Remember, in the beginning of this talk, I gave you those two books. He's going to move that because guess what? He wants to start us off in slavery. Freedom, enslavement, and resistance. No. We can't teach them about how they resisted. They don't need to know those stories. They need to just understand that Abraham Lincoln freed them. It was the good old white government that freed them. They didn't fight and didn't force us to free them. Our hearts just turned good. They just We just turned gold and we decided to give them the freedom that they want. The practice of freedom, you don't need to understand the marches and the, the protests and the, the sit-ins and the revolts from, um, from going to work. And you don't, you don't need to learn about that. And then the movements and debates, they don't need to learn about the, so that's what he's trying to take away from us now. And so that's up to us if, he, if we allow him to take it away or not. That's on, that's on us, and I'm more so putting that on y'all's shoulders because the only people who have really been at the forefront throughout all of our history, whatever era you want me to take you to, has been young people. You probably don't even know about the, the, um, the civil rights march that was led by teenagers. Nobody talks about the, children, the children's march. I'm talking about nine-year-olds through 16-year-olds that went out and protested against the government during the 1960s. How come they don't tell us about that? The quote that I will say is that elders are for counsel, counsel, youth are for war. That's an old African proverb. So here are just some of the things that we need in our community that we don't have. We don't have communities. We have black neighborhoods. A neighborhood is different from a community. Until we get a independent, our independent Black schools, our own independent Black banks, our independent healthcare facilities, our manufacturing and distribution centers, our independent supermarkets with healthy, affordable food options, those are the things that we need to fo focus on in the Black community in order for, in order for, in the Black neighborhood so we, that we can truly make it a community. And understand that Black visibility is not Black power. Just because you in front of a mic or just because you got a bullhorn out in the street or just because you may have been elected to office, that's not black power. And sometimes we get that confused. So we need to understand that also the ultimate values and goals of black power are not domination or exploitation of other groups, but rather an effective share in the total power of society. And a quote that, uh, I forgot who this was by, but a quote said, oh, here, yeah, there's a young men, young men and women for war, old men and women for counsel. But I don't think students will ever be satisfied, he said. I don't think they should be satisfied. I think it's the responsibility of students and Black students in particular rooted in the long tradition of student protest and activism to continue to push the institution to be better. And so the last thing that we have right now in this community 
and it's, it's it's not a good thing. But the last the last stronghold we have right now in the black community are our HBCUs. Our HBCUs are the last institutions that we have where that is truly a training ground for building up the next leaders in our community. And I want you all to recognize the space that you're in right now. And I want you all to develop the courage to go out there and do the best that you can and become the best versions of yourselves that you can. Do not mix the college with the streets or with the neighborhoods. You are there in a training ground because you were you are supposed to be developing the skills to go out and to do phenomenal, empowering, significant things in the world. And so with this time, you need to learn how to organize, build networks, learn about your education, learn about your story, not just the classroom for whatever your major is, but really learn about who we are. And because we will be sustained and our progress will be exhibited when we learn to collectively come together as men and women and work and build on what our ancestors put out there. Pan-Africanism, the Black Panther Party, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Harlem Renaissance, the UNI, Marcus Garvey, whoever, all of that stuff is supposed to, they gave you a framework, but we're supposed to make it better. Remember, they all got their, they all got cut off some, some shape or form. But when you were birthed and brought into this world, you were supposed to pick that up and make it better and make it more aligned to whatever we're going through today. So I hope that that empowers you. And the last thing that I'll tell you is this quote. If you're Christian, if you follow the Bible, then you should know it from Proverbs 17, 10. A wise person will learn more from a warning than a fool will learn from a hundred lashings. But if you are not religious, then you should still be able to gather the same sentiments out of this quote. A wise person learns from their own mistakes. A wiser person learns from the mistakes of others. But the wisest learns Jay, from you the got success the of others. The and with that, I appreciate you all again for this talk. Um, and I'm open to any questions or brothers, however you want to conclude this conversation. And thank everybody for your time. Oh, last thing too, if you want to, I'm gonna still be doing more talks and things. Um, so if you wanna follow, I'm gonna do deeper dives and some of the things that I went over, but that's gonna be on my YouTube channel. Uh, I did start a YouTube channel where I talk about black history, contemporary um, things that are going on and it's house of I-10. I'll put that in the chat um, real quick. So if you wanna come over there just to learn a little bit more um, about some of our history and learn more about certain movements, um, you can definitely come to that channel. And um, again, that's on YouTube. Thank you. We will now open it up for questions. Uh, if anybody have questions, you can raise your hand. Go ahead, Jason. And this may be a uh, conversation for another day, but I want, wanted to bring up um, desegregation uh, as opposed to um, what are the, the movement that happened, I guess, in the 60s with uh, with uh, the desegregation, um, um, the segregation movement. Oh, what about what about desegregation? Well, we better off, or are we better off, deseg desegregated than we were when we were segregated? I mean, well, I mean, we look at it today. We we're not better off. So there there's a social right. So the desegregation that was a social gain. And a lot of what we look at, and this is why part of why Malcolm X was assassinated, is because the government is willing to give us the social gains, right? So recognize my humanity, allow me to come to this particular business or to go here. Um, don't separate me. But the way that they ended up, the reason why we ended up getting desegregation 
is because white people pushed for it. It was it was some white businessmen and some white influencers who said, hold on, wait a minute. Well, I just realized something. We need to let them come to our businesses. We don't have to like them, but what do they have that 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 is the same across the board? Money. So we get access to their dollars that improves our business. If they want to come shop with us, if they want to come spend that, we need to do that because money then leads to real estate. Money then leads to uh, more freedoms, more liberties. So we ended up taking our dollar that was circulating in the Black community and we invested it in their community. Then I now our community is starting to lose that change over that flow of money. And now we have disinvested from our community. Our homes went down. The quality of our schools went down. But guess what? Who benefited from that? It sure wasn't us. If you look around, the people who benefited from desegregation was not Black people. So did that answer, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, that um, basically speaks to a, a point that I'm, I want to kind of delve into further. And like I said, it's, it's a topic for another day as to if you remember or you've heard in history talking about Black Wall Street, it's something that <clears throat> the powers that be uh, definitely fought against, didn't necessarily want us to have our own. Uh, and that may be something, or not maybe, but it is something that we need to probably move more, more, move back to, is to uh, investing in our own community. Uh, and, and doing that, we, we become, uh, like uh, Marcus Darby uh, talked about, was to uh, 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 come together as a community. Right, right. And I mean, absolutely. So <clears throat> for other communities in the Asian community, the dollar overturns nine times before it leaves the community in the Asian community. So which means that the, the, the dry cleaners, they take their money to the Chinese, like to, to for food and for groceries, right? So the the eight, so I dated an Asian. So I'm talking about this from experience. The food that the Asians give us and sell us is not the food that they eat. I know that for a fact. But so um, there's no we go buy Chinese food. We're we're helping. They don't come and then they don't go to GNGs. I don't see no Asian people. They don't go to GNGs and spend their money. They don't go to Olean's and spend their money with us. Just think about that. I'm not saying anything is wrong with it, but we're talking about economic sustainability. So we just, sometimes we got to look around and see what's going on. Asian dollars overspends nine times before it leaves the community. In the white community, it overturns eight times. This is out of the Covenant of Black America by Tavis Smiley. Um, it overturns eight times before it leaves the community. In the black community, the dollar overturns less than one time before it leaves the community. So it doesn't go through nine different businesses. It doesn't go through eight different businesses. As soon as you get your hands on your dollars, you go and spend it somewhere else outside of our community. And in some places, you'll see that it says it spends less than six hours in our community. There's some people who found a way to do it from a time frame. But the point is that, yeah, we need to find ways. That's why I had that slide and said that we need to find ways to create these things right here. So that way our money can start to overturn more because Killer Mike did this. I think it's called trigger warning in season one. It was like, well, black people talk about they prepared. They want to go to war. They want to be free. He's like, you ain't even in a position to be free. You can't even buy your own, your own black owned toothpaste. You can't even buy, you can't even buy black owned toilet paper to wipe your butt. But you talking about going to war with somebody, you talking about, you know, so there are some things that we have to get in place first. Um, if we do want to start to uh, do it for self. And it's, it's small, it's definitely small, but we just have to have a plan. If I ask anybody on this, on this call right now, what is the, what is the black plan? Like, what is our plan? What is our cultural plan? What does that look like? I'll probably get however many different answers for the participants that's on this call. And that's, that's a problem 
Um, so we need something to build off of. But thank you for that, that question, that conversation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, brother AK. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our uh, brother Chaplain pray us out. Everyone, please bow their heads, close their eyes. Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day once again, Lord. Thank you for enabling us to be productive during this discussion. Lord, let what we discussed have been fruit in our lives and in other people. Cover us with the blood of your son, Jesus, and show us how to use this information that we learned here for your glory. In your name we all pray. Amen. 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 Thank you again, brother. All right. Thank you all. Good night.